Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel. The guy, Douglas McGregor, asserts the precariousness of the situation, indicating an incomplete understanding of events. He emphasizes the close relationship between the Secretary of Defense and the President, likening the former to a Deputy Commander-in-Chief. McGregor clarifies that while the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs is the senior military advisor to the President by law, the Secretary of Defense holds a significantly broader role as outlined in Title X. Expressing uncertainty about recent developments involving Lloyd Austin, McGregor hopes for Austin's recovery and suggests that there may be more to the story. He speculates that other White House officials, including the National Security Advisory and members of the National Security Council, might have been aware of the situation. Despite not being a supporter of Austin, McGregor acknowledges his behind-the-scenes advocacy for military restraint, implying that his voice is valued, albeit possibly overlooked. The unfolding events could potentially underscore the significance of Austin's influence. There was a notable residue of distrust and contempt toward the Russians during the Balkan campaigns, particularly in Bosnia-Herzegovina and later in Kosovo, I. A. This sentiment, dismissed initially as a relic of the Cold War, persists among certain individuals who harbor animosity towards Russia, which is deemed counterproductive and irrational. Regarding Biden, he has expressed varied stances on different occasions, which some attribute to his age and mental state. One can discern a separation between Biden's positions. He has garnered support from various influential donors, including the Israel lobby, and historically aligned with the interests of his benefactors. Consequently, his views on Israel are perceived as consistent with his broader donor relationships. Conversely, his stance on Russia may reflect either an enduring Cold War mentality or a pragmatic alignment with donor interests. Within the political sphere, skepticism towards most politicians, especially those within the Beltway, prevails. While the Israelis remain agitated and resolute leveraging U.S. support for their objectives, including the displacement of Arabs from Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. The feasibility and consequences of such actions are questioned. Despite warnings against escalation, both in Washington and Jerusalem, the trajectory appears towards further conflict. The potential for an unmanageable situation looms large with repercussions extending beyond Israel's control. The ongoing conflict in Gaza underscores the volatile sentiments within the region demanding a nuanced understanding from policymakers who risk political repercussions if they fail to address escalating tensions. Certainly, when considering Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and Iraq, they all recognize the need to pivot away from Israel in a line with a growing coalition in the region against it. In Egypt, there are concerns about potential ramifications, with many viewing such actions as tantamount to an act of war, while President Sisi is perceived as aligned with both Israeli and American interests. There's skepticism about his ability to resist pressures from both fronts. Failure to address the perceived injustices in Gaza could jeopardize his tenure. Elites in power, accustomed to governance through a mix of coercion and inducement, must reckon with a populace increasingly unwilling to accept status quo arrangements. Regarding the conflict along the northern border, whether it involves 96,000 or 250,000, 1,000 individuals, including Israelis, living in the affected areas, the situation remains untenable. Despite public support for current actions, there's a recognition within Israeli leadership that the God's operation hasn't unfolded as planned. Consequently, clearly, there's a strategic interest in redirecting attention towards Hezbollah. However, engaging Hezbollah would likely escalate into a protracted and resource-intensive conflict, prompting apprehension within the Israeli military ranks. If the United States decides to support the Israeli Defense Force against Hezbollah, it would likely involve predominantly aerial and offshore missile strikes and air raids. However, such action carries inherent current risks, including potential losses of aircraft and naval vessels. The response from the American public remains uncertain, with some likely to support the intervention, while others may raise questions about the strategic rationale and long-term consequences, especially given the absence of a clear strategy beyond unconditional support for Israel. The Israelis are inclined to act swiftly due to their reliance on citizen soldiers who cannot sustain prolonged military engagements. However, the current trajectory of conflict with Hezbollah presents, 
challenges in terms of finding an off-ramp, leading to a dynamic where the momentum of conflict dictates actions. Regarding the feasibility of engaging in a two-front war, while conventional wisdom suggests it may strain the Israeli Defense Force strategic adjustments, such as focusing forces around Gaza and intensifying aerial pressure, could enable a concerted effort against Hezbollah. However, the success of such an endeavor hinges significantly on active support from the United States, as well as considerations of the complex military landscape in Lebanon and Syria, including Russian air defense systems in Hezbollah's formidable arsenal. Ultimately, the outcome may depend on the willingness of the U.S. to commit its air and naval power to support Israel's actions. Looking back at the consequences of our strike, it's evident that we effectively designated the region into the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean as a war zone. Consequently, major insurance corporations have ceased insuring vessels navigating through that area, effectively halting commercial shipping. Reports indicate that a commercial vessel was attacked today, suggesting that our actions haven't deterred the Hoda this as intended. This have demonstrated resilience in the face of past conflicts with Saudi forces and al-Qaeda. They pose a persistent challenge and will likely continue disrupting traffic through the Gate of Tears into the Red Sea. The feasibility of sustained military presence in the region depends on logistical support and financial investment. While options like Diego Garcia and Djibouti exist, they may not adequately support ongoing operations. Maintaining a permanent naval presence off the coast of Yemen and in the Indian Ocean presents significant challenges, especially considering the logistical demands and operational the complexities involved. If sustaining a combat or carrier battle group in the eastern Mediterranean has proven challenging, the prospect of maintaining operations in this new theater may be even more daunting. The problem with President Biden is that he established publishes certain red lines and then later modifies his stance. For instance, early on during the Ukraine conflict, he stated he wouldn't send certain types of equipment or technologies to Ukraine to avoid escalating to World War II, specifically mentioning cruise missiles. Initially, this declaration pertained a rocket artillery. He also expressed reluctance to deploy U.S. forces on the ground in Ukraine. However, despite this, reports indicate that around 4-5-1500 or 5, 1500 individuals have been killed on the ground in Ukraine. While they may not have been in U.S. uniform, they were present and lost their lives, potentially as contractors or individuals temporarily assigned to such roles. We have a concern about President Biden's approach arises from his pattern of shifting positions. For instance, there's apprehension that he might backtrack on his stance regarding Iran as he allegedly conveyed a message to Iran regarding the Hutsalvis, which some find questionable. To be assured, despite being portrayed as Iranians by some, are Arabs with allegiances similar to Arab militias in Iraq. They align themselves with Hamas and Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, aiming to inflict damage and potentially leverage against Israel. Regardless of any directives from Tehran, their Arab identity remains paramount. He views battle damage assessment as more of an art than a straightforward process. It involves analyzing the impact of airstrikes or missile strikes, which often leads to varying interpretations. He acknowledges that wishful thinking can influence such assessments, particularly since air forces, including naval forces, tend to have a vested interest in deeming operations successful. He expresses skepticism about the effectiveness of recent assessments, citing the continued strikes by the Halop this against commercial vessels. He anticipates potential strikes against naval vessels as well. This have demonstrated resilience in the face of past conflicts with Saudi forces and al-Qaeda. They pose a persistent challenge and will likely continue disrupting traffic through the Gate of Tears into the Red Sea. The feasibility of sustained military presence in the region depends on logistical support and financial investment. While options like Diego Garcia and Djibouti exist, they may not adequately support ongoing operations. Maintaining a permanent naval presence off the coast of Yemen and in the Indian Ocean presents significant challenges, especially considering the logistical demands and operational the complexities involved. If sustaining a combat or carrier battle group in the eastern Mediterranean has proven challenging, the prospect of maintaining operations in this new theater may be even more daunting. The problem with President Biden is that he established publishes certain red lines and then later modifies his stand. For instance, early on during the Ukraine conflict, 
He stated he wouldn't send certain types of equipment or technologies to Ukraine to avoid escalating to World War III, specifically mentioning cruise missiles. Initially, this declaration pertained to rocket artillery. He also expressed reluctance to deploy U.S. forces on the ground in Ukraine. However, despite this, reports indicate that around 4 5 1,500 individuals have been killed on the ground in Ukraine. While they may not have been in U.S. uniform, they were present and lost their lives, potentially as contractors or individuals temporarily assigned to such roles. We have a concern about President Biden's approach arises from his pattern of shifting positions. For instance, there's apprehension that he might backtrack on his stance regarding Iran, as he allegedly conveyed a message to Iran regarding the Hatsalvis, which some find questionable. To be assured, despite being portrayed as Iranians by some, are Arabs with allegiances similar to Arab militias in Iraq. They align themselves with Hamas and Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, aiming to inflict damage and potentially leverage against Israel. Regardless of any directives from Tehran, their Arab identity remains paramount. He views battle damage assessment as more of an art than a straightforward process. It involves analyzing the impact of airstrikes or missile strikes, which often leads to varying interpretations. He acknowledges that wishful thinking can influence such assessments, particularly since air forces, including naval forces, tend to have a vested interest in deeming operations successful. He expresses skepticism about the effectiveness of recent assessments, citing the continued strikes by the Holoptis against commercial vessels. He anticipates potential strikes against naval vessels as well.